Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Hunter O'Haney and the director of the Stonewall National Museum and Archives here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And we're very happy to have all of you here. And I want you to say hello to our guests this evening, Bo McCall and Sulio. Hello to both of you. Say hi. Good evening. Good evening. Nice to see both of you. Where are we finding you this evening? Harlem. <laughs> Harlem, that's good. Harlem. I, I want to cross street now. I want to know the main street and the cross street. We're two blocks away from the Apollo. Got it. Perfect. Very good. Very good. Well, it's great here. It's great to have you here in South Florida with us. And we're very much looking forward to talking about Rewind, Memories on Repeat, and, and the work that you two have been doing. Uh, just to let everybody know a little bit about Stonewall, uh, we are located here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. We're one of the largest LGBTQ libraries and archives in the United States. The library has over 28,000 volumes in the library. It's believed to be the largest LGBTQ library in the world. And we also have uh, Bo and Sulio's book in our library. You see right here, it's listed as one of the new books. Uh, we, we've had it for a while there, but so we're very happy that that's in the library. But we're located at 1300 East Sunrise um, in Fort Lauderdale. So if you're here in South Florida, please stop by and say hello. Um, in our archive, we have 2,700 uh, linear feet of archival material mostly from 1950 to the present day. And to think about what 2,700 linear feet uh, amounts to in archival material, it's all the way up one side of the Empire State Building and all the way down the other. It relates to wow. six million pages of LGBTQ history, which is just sort of astonishing. So from those materials, we're probably the second or third largest LGBTQ archive in the U US. Um, from those materials, we then form exhibitions. And so right now we have two shows up, one called Don't Ask, Do Tell, which is about the tortured uh, relationship between the U.S. military and the LGBTQ community, starting all the way back to George Washington and a lieutenant that he had who was arrested for sodomy, going all the way up to the present day with Joe Biden, who uh, re re removed all re restrictions for LGBTQ individuals serving in the military. And we did that show to, in uh, marking the uh, 10th anniversary of the end of of the don't ask, don't tell policy. Um, and also just as a shout out for all those people who are part of the trans and gay and queer communities out there that the Veterans Administration recently announced it in September that it would be restoring all of the benefits to those who were dishonorably discharged because of their sexual orientation. And so that's a really good thing as a result of things that have been happening and be able to expose this. The other thing that we have up right now is a show called Misinformation. And um, that was kind of personal for, for me in the sense that as I was watching things going on with COVID and all the misinformation about COVID, it brought me back to the time in which I remember I was a young man just getting out of college at the time. And I remembered all the misinformation that came out in the early days of the AIDS crisis. And so what's astonishing about looking at the materials in that show is we're seeing so many of the issues are the same, that the fears and, um, and the crazy science and all this stuff, it is, it's almost uh, verbatim exactly the same it was 40 years ago. And so please come by and see that. For those of you who want to know more about the archive and the library, you can go to stonewall-museum.org and you can uh, search our card catalog and there's also a finding aid there for you to see items that are in the, uh, that are in the archive as well. I would like to say hello to my colleague, Paula Sierra, who's behind the scenes here in Miami. Hello, Paula, how are you tonight? I am doing well, thank you. Thank you. So for those of you, of you who are in South Florida, please come by to the Miami Book Fair this coming weekend. Paula and I will be there on Friday. We will have a booth at the Miami Book Fair uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And we will be selling duplicate copies of books for a buck a piece, um, except for the big hardcover books. Those will be $10 a piece and it'll be nice to be able to see all of you there. Uh, one last thing, I wanna thank our friends at the R Fund Foundation. Uh, they're the ones who've made it available, provided funding for us to do these talks 
and, and helping us out with stipends for the artists. And so thank you, our fund for the work uh, that you're doing. And I think that's all I have on my important announcements here. So let's go back to our guests, um, Sulio and Bo, it's nice to see you, as I said. So um, Bo, let me quickly pull up your bio here um, because it's really sort of fascinating. Um, you know, you have a big, um, you have a big reputation in the craft world. You're known as the button man, which I think is just wonderful. And you've used your art and your craft um, to uh, further topics around social justice and pop culture. Uh, your work has been presented from museums to major retail stores to private individuals, um, everybody from Debbie Harry to the New York Times have, have uh, collected your, your work um, and have talked about your work, uh, which is just amazing. I have a little quote here about you, about buttons themselves, but just give us a little bit of your background. You know, how did you get to be the artist you are today? And, and, um, and what is it like being a maker? What's, you know, tell us, tell us who Bo is. Well, I kind of feel like I was born um artistic i knew early on that i had some something special um i have two other brothers who are very athletic and i did not get that dna <laughs> <laughs> i was i was well aware of it early on so um i can remember like maybe in first grade that i would be making stuff in school i remember we had this um it was this blue paper, but the paper had some type of um, fabric woven into the paper. So I was very fascinated behind this paper. So I took the paper home and I started making different little things. Um, and then I was a very quiet child. So, you know, every time my mother would find me, I would be somewhere creating something. Um, so that bug has been with me as early as I can remember. Mm -hmm. um, where did you Man, grow up? Oh, oh where did you grow up? From Philadelphia. Philadelphia, yeah. yeah. So, you know, I, at some point, I knew I was going to move to New York because as a kid, I used to watch Johnny Carson when he used to come on in the daytime with Merv Griffin, right? Sure. So they talk about Bloomingdale's, and I wanted to go to Bloomingdale's. So um, my first trip to New York, I got off work early one day, and I just got the Amtrak, and I came to New York. I didn't know anything. All I knew was I wanted to go to Bloomingdale's. And Bergdorf's was in the area. So I went to Bloomingdale's and bought a few things. And I went to Bergdorf's and bought a pair of socks. And I was a, um, a LaBelle fanatic at the time. And on the back of one of their album covers, they said they got their hair done at this place called San Andres. <laughs> so I went to San Andres and got a haircut. You know, I just made a whole day out of it. Sure. But long story short, when I uh, arrived in New York to stay permanently, I came here with the intent to do something creative. Now, I didn't know whether I wanted to be a fashion designer. I didn't know whether I wanted to be a visual artist. I just know, I knew that I wanted to do something creative. So when I got here, I discovered the uh, Black Fashion Museum. So I dealt with them for about 10 years, and they were the first um, people to expose me as far as my buttons and my wearable art was concerned. Um, so, tell, so tell the audience about the Black Fashion Museum. Well, the Black Fashion Museum, how I got introduced to it, um, uh, Harlem used to have Harlem, well, they still have Harlem Week, but they used to have this big festival, river to river, from the east uh, to the west side. It'll be all these vendors, it'll be a, a, all entertainment, you'd have jazz, hip hop, R&B, you name it, it was there on 125th Street. It was just a sea of faces from all over the world. So I had never seen that many black people in an urban city all at one time. It was a beautiful experience. So um, later on that evening, they had this show called Uptown Saturday Night, which was put on by the Black Fashion Museum. And the creator of that was Lois Alexander. Hmm. I saw these black models, I saw these black designers. Um, I met some of the administrators and I told the person that I was with at the time, I said, I'm going to be a part of this next year. So, you know, they laughed it off. Yeah, whatever. So <laughs> a friend of 
and called me and said that they were doing auditions. And by this time I had embellished maybe a, a dozen Levi jackets and I did some jeans and some bustiers and corsets. And I went to the audition, they reviewed my work and they said, ask me, when can I start? So it started maybe almost a 10 year relationship with them, with them ex exposing my talent. Um, mm -hmm. That was the first group of friends. Cause at that point, the only people that I knew was the people that I worked with. I hadn't developed any relationships as far as um, friendships or intimate relationships. So I was very um, close knit with them. We were like one huge family of creatives. And, and, so, and so you you spoke about the idea of embellishing and adding buttons and doing and um, improving objects and fashion and putting that there. Um, did you learn that as a child? Was that something that there were uh, family members, whether um, your um, your parent no. level or did you? Was there any support for that when you were a kid? This is how it how um, I got exposed to that. I grew up in the projects, and the projects that I grew up in, we had four buildings, and then we had a recreation center in the center of the four buildings, which we called the center, right? And they had after-school programs. They had all these different types of programs during the summer. So I would go there every day, especially during the summer. They would take us on all type of cultural trips. But when we, when we, we, we would be in the actual center, they had all these crafts. So I learned how to tie-dye. I learned how to weave. I learned how to macrame. Um, it was various different crafts that I learned. And... When I would go shopping, um, I really liked the really expensive things. So I would be inspired by some of the things that I saw. So I would go home and make something inspired by what I saw that particular day, evening, whatever. And then my mother always supported what I did. So one week, week I might be making uh, crepe paper uh, flowers. And I would get bored after a month of that, and I would come back, and I said, oh, you know, I want to make beads. And she would run out and, or give me money, and I would go get these little seed beads from, from Tandy Leathercraft. Yeah. And then there, Tandy's, they had a, um, they had a macrame class. <laughs> when I took the class, it was all these senior ladies in the class. But for some odd reason, I caught on quicker than they did. Mm. And uh, I sort of excelled in that. And every time somebody exposed me to a different craft, I would go home and say, Mom, I want to do such and such. And she would just provide me with the material. So it's, it started like that at, at the recreation center. And, and then, of course, you know, craft is such a huge history in the United States and also among the African-American community as well, as far as being able to use resources and be able to do it that way. Um, any thoughts that you have about, you know, the role of craft in society and, and sort of how it fits there t today? I mean, you've invested your life in the craft movement. Well, you know, it was, I came up in a, in a period of time wherein things weren't mass produced. Yeah. So everybody's mother or grandmother or your neighbor, they had a sewing machine in the house and it was plenty of butter patterns around and they will make their clothes. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, um, things became mass produced. So these skills became obsolete. Like you wouldn't see a needle and thread or you wouldn't go to your neighbor's house and her mom was sitting there sewing her prime gown or something like that. It just sort of phased out. Mm -hmm. But I was attracted to that you could sit in your house, in your bedroom, anywhere in the house and you could create something without going outside. And um, sometimes I could just see things and I could just recreate it to, uh, to my liking. Now, currently, I think it's a pool of creatives who have dedicated themselves to craft. But at the same time, I think craft in general, as far as the art scene goes, Craft is not high on, on the totem pole because people still look at craft like it's it's something really elementary. It's something for 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 an elementary school kid uh, program or like the after school programs. It's not until um, 
whatever it is that you're creating that captures their attention. Because it's now it's serious. Yeah. When you see craft, you don't know what you're going to get. Because I've been to plenty of craft fairs and the level of expertise, the level of quality, the, the bar has risen. You know, so you know, and I, I and, and, and right. trust me, trust me, I certainly believe that. I mean, in the sense that I think the craft um, has been undersold. A lot of it might be the result of sort of the aesthetic of art history, which is controlled. Uh, and I have many art historian friends out there, but the fact that they have sort of looked down on craft as opposed to quote unquote fine arts, I, I, that distinction to me doesn't really make any difference. Um, and so it's just sort of, you know, it's the cultural bu bubble that we're in right now. And I think it's driven a lot by academia and that stuff. Mm -hmm. So I agree with you 100%. Before we move over to Sulio, I have to ask you, tell us about this beautiful piece that you have on the top of your shirt here. It's really gorgeous from what I can see. So this is an, uh, a collar. A collar, so yeah. This is when I work on a particular project and whatever the remains are before I start the next project, I take the scraps and try to create something personal for myself. So this is what came out of that. Yeah, it's absolutely gorgeous. What kind of materials are in there? This is on denim. They're plastic red buttons, all different shades and hues of red. And then the front gold metal buttons. And if I slide it around, it's all red, glossy. Oh, look how beautiful that red is there. On You know, it's just absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. You can turn, turn around. And then these are, I did a, a workshop yesterday where we made button chains so yesterday all the button chains are made out of uh, plastic buttons and the ones i have on today these are mother of pearl so these are like uh the button version of a pearl necklace beautiful beautiful and so we but we put your website here in the chat and for those of you who are watching live right now um if you're on facebook hello everybody on F facebook we're happy to have you, you here as well too if you have questions while we're doing this live you can certainly throw them into the chat and we will get to them if you want to say hi or ask a question please feel free because we'll be m monitoring that as well so uh let's go to sulio sulio you look fabulous um so sulio and i worked together probably i don't know 10 years ago at Leslie Lohman or something. But so, um, Sula, you for a while have been a curator and an event producer and really sort of trying to bring cultural production uh, from different voices uh, to larger audiences. Tell me a little bit about how you got into that, because I'm not quite sure I know your background that brought you to where you are today. Yeah, well, I've always loved the arts and creativity and, and culture, um, but how I specifically got into visual art, it was really through uh, my brother who passed, who was murdered. Um, he was an artist, Glenn Spoof White. And when I met Bo, um, you know, these were two artists in my personal life that I knew um, who I felt deserved a, a larger platform. So it really was me wanting to um, expose their work to the world. Um, mm -hmm. So I took a uh, tour in Harlem by Jacqueline Orange of Romeo Bearden. Um, and so on that tour, we had a stop at um, Strivers Gardens Gallery. And I met Lisa Hayes, the curator of that space. And I told her, I want to do a show. I had no credentials, no, you know, like no official qualifications. Um, but she took a chance on me. And so that I did my first show there, co-curated with her. And we had Danny Simmons. Um, as the uh, headline of that show, and it was featuring emerging artists, uh, including Bo and my brother and, and, and several others. So and it also seems to me from an art making standpoint, you you put yourself out there as a persona in the sense, I mean, the, the images that we use to promote this particular talk, for example, are those beautiful images with your head back and all the yellow, they're so dramatic. And even here, with your headdress and your shirt and your necklace and your glasses. It's really such a beautiful look that you presented to us. Thank you. Well, you know, for me, it's having fun. I enjoy dressing up. I enjoy expressing myself. I'm not a, I'm not a, a visual artist. So I don't make things in that, in that perspective, but I just appreciate it. And adorning one's body is, is, is self-expression. 
and having and finding joy. And for me, that that's that's what it does. I really enjoy it. <laughs> and he, he's also my muse. Yes, that's it. I'm wearing I'm wearing his button um, shoulder, so I have buttons on too. Fabulous, fabulous. So, how have you guys been? Um, how how have you dealt during COVID? I, I was looking at some some numbers this morning, and you know, you probably saw six months ago the numbers here in Florida were really terrible, and and now Florida's uh, Florida actually the number of new cases here in Florida is actually lower than it is in New York City. We're actually doing better here, uh, which is a, a good thing. Uh, how have you done over the last year and a half with all of this COVID stuff? It's been so tough for so many people. Yeah, it was tough. I mean, so I did lose my grandmother to COVID. She passed. Um, she was in a nursing home. And so, you know, we had a whole scandal with how the Cuomo administration handled nursing homes and, and COVID deaths. And so that was very hard. Um, and but outside of that, um, I have been fortunate to professionally. I think we've reached new heights in, in, in both of our in our, in our careers. Um, we've done. Uh, I did a show with the Schomburg Center on the Black Fashion Museum and Harlem, Harlem Institute of Fashion. Um, we uh, I become his studio manager. We were in the house, and I was like, "Let me just like let me start managing you. I have nothing else to do." And so. Since then, you know, we've been able to get him acquired by the Museum of Art and Design and the Victoria and Albert Museum and, you know, the Stonewall Museum. So we really just sort of hunkered down and just focused even more on our on our uh, professional craft and, and work. Yeah, and a lot of doors opened that mm -hmm. was previously closed to us that really um, we were under the radar. Yeah. So some of the people that we approach we were like fresh and new to them. Yeah. When you know, we've been in, on the art scene for almost 15 years now. Yeah. I think I think when when everyone was at home, um, you know, it sort of leveled the playing field in terms of assets in a way. Um, because we were able to email people and like, hey, you can't uh, you know, do a studio visit um in person, but we can use Zoom. And so, you know, it was like, okay, there's no excuse not to Yes, use and then the they actually <laughs> responded yeah. to the email. Yeah. Well, I, I'm so happy to hear you say it because, of course, this has been what many nonprofit organizations and independent artists and writers have done, and particularly a lot of queer ones have done. I mean, it's sort of astonishing to me to this, for this organization, Fort Lauderdale, we've had over 40,000 people see these talks, which, quite frankly, I wouldn't be able to invite the two of you down. I wouldn't have the budget to pay for you to travel down here. But here you're now, we're having this conversation. Of course, we all want to get back to where we're seeing things live. But I hope that this part of sharing information doesn't go away, because I think it's a great way for us to do it. People tell me they listen to these things as podcasts at night, and they, you know, they listen to them in the car, and they do all those kind of things. And they just take information in now different ways. And I love the fact particularly the queer folks um, and artists have actually tried to figure out how to turn this sort of awful situation um, into something that has been good for them and bring them out to a wider audience. And it's also made us focus on documentation and getting our personal archives together. So we're working on um, establishing both of our papers and getting those into collections because, you know, during the pandemic, you realize that life can turn just like that so quickly and here today, gone tomorrow, right? It made it very real for all of us. And so we wanted to make sure that we were doing the work necessary to document our lives, especially as Black queer people, you know, our narratives are very underrepresented. And so that's something that, that we're working on. Yeah, and I think that's really important for you to do it. I mean, our archive, uh, no fault, but it's, you know, it's true of ours as it is for many that um, people of color and sort of outsider artists are vastly underrepresented. As we all know, a lot of the gay and the queer community, the forward facing part tends to be very white, tends to be very male, tends to be, you know, very cisgender. And so what's nice is that I think it's led a lot of people to understand that there are these, there are these 
deficits that we can actually work to start bringing them out there. And uh, I was saying to somebody today about archives are sort of the last step in activism because with activists, you know, you want to get out there and say messages and change laws and change people's minds. But the last part of it is actually making sure that that history is recorded for future generations. And of course, that's what libraries and archives and, his and history museums do. And um, so that's why it's great that we, you know, we, we, we do all this. And even for this chat to be re recorded is important for somebody to see this 50 years from now. And, uh, and that, that's key. Yes. Yeah, that's the whole point. Mm -hmm. To sure. leave the leave the trail, leave the legacy behind. Yep. Yep. So uh, we have a qu question here from Peter, um, and the P uh, Peter's question is for you, Bo. Uh, how old is the necklace that you're wearing, and how long did it take to make it? Uh, but Peter loves that. P Peter lo loves that ne necklace. I thought he was going to ask how old are you. We know Peter. We know. <laughs> I'm not going there. <laughs> The red one is a couple months old. This oh. isn't really new. But the chains, these are probably 25, 30 years old. Wow. Well, well. Yeah. I did these when I um, was affiliated with the Black Fashion Museum. So that's how great. Long, how, long, how long did it take you to make that red one? The red one, um, well, in COVID time, about two weeks. Well, great. Yeah. And are, if people are interested in your objects, can they can they inquire uh, from you through your website? They can um, go through my website. They can go to um, um, email info at bomacall.com. <laughs> Thank you, Sulu. <Celia. laughs> You're doing your job. You're doing your, your job to be promoting it. All right. So let's talk a little bit about this project. Um, Shine Portrait Studio presents a Bo McCall Rewide Memories on Repeat in Plume House of Prayer Series 2, Newark, New Jersey, uh, 2021. And so tell me how this project started. You want to say? No, you go. Oh, uh, okay. So um, Nick Klein um, approached me. I, I used to work at the Newark Museum, and so we knew each other in Newark. Um, and so he approached me about um, potentially doing some sort of artist book. Um, and so I said, well, you know, I'm not an artist, um, but I, said, I don't know if I can do anything, but my partner's an artist and I, he has a story to tell. And so I went to Bo and we started talking and he came up, you know, with the idea of um, tributing his friends. And yeah, so we, I, so I started brainstorming ideas. And I thought this would be the perfect opportunity to spotlight and give a tribute to some of my closest friends, some my friends who I thought I was going to be old and gray with. Yeah. So it's, it's 10 of my closest friends that um, I spotlighted in, in Rewind. So for those of you who are not familiar with the project, of course, uh, there are wonderful spreads here um, in the project of work. We're going to look at some slides here, but it is... Uh, devoted to 10 individuals. Um, so, Bo, bring us back to what went on as to how you lost these individuals. So, there was AIDS, there was diabetes, there was murders, there was uh, heart problems. It was a series of things, but it started with AIDS. Mm. And when the AIDS epidemic hit, um, in Philly, the black gay community is very small. Mm -hmm. You know, we would all be at the same clubs, same hangouts. So we all were six degrees of separation. Somebody knew somebody that knew somebody. So by that time I had moved to New York and every time I called home, it was like, do you remember so-and-so? They died. They had the virus. They had the virus. So it kept getting closer and closer to the group of my group of friends. So, you know, it's really not real until it hits home. So when it finally hit, it was one of my closest friends. We were, we were roommates together, the three of us. And it was devastating. And then from there, just everything went downhill. I think I, I went into a state of depression. Um, it took me, myself, it took me about maybe two years to go get tested because I was afraid. Yeah. 
you know. And then, you know, I finally went and got tested. You know, everything was fine. And then, you know, when you're younger and, you know, you got a wild side, and, you know, I was very sheltered early on, but I took a walk on the wild side. <laughs> you know, I got involved and I, you know, I did my dirt just like any any other young person. Sure. Um, sure. Somebody asked me this question recently, and I'll pose it to you. Um, can you tell me your earliest memory of hearing about some disease that was affecting gay people? I can remember hanging out one night and everybody was out. And then, you know, it was the first time I heard the word AIDS, right? So when we heard it in the black community for the first time, to us, it was like, that's for white folks. Mm. It's not about black people. Right, it's just about white men, white gay men. So that's when the buzz initially started. I was outside, I, was a, with a, I remember being with a group of friends and we just all had this conversation and then we ignored it. Mm. And then it just started getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Then when we started seeing black folks, it was like, oh, it's us too. Yeah. So everybody starts sitting up straight and start paying attention to the news and then it, it became um it was almost like a stereotype because when black folks you knew somebody had it because they got pitch black and then their hair got real curly and their eyes got real glassy so we knew so for me personally when i would see somebody they had that look it was almost like i was having a panic attack because mm. I would be thumping out of my shirt. Who was going to be next? Who was going to be next? Who was going to be next? So, you know, as far as um, my sex drive and my sex appeal, you know, I thought I curbed everything. I just like put up the red flag. It was like, no, 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 no. We just started paying attention to all the literature that was coming out. You saw it everywhere. It was you know, in the magazines, it was on the bus, it was all kind of promos. And then, you know, it started passing out condoms and all kind of stuff. So you, you started to pay attention. And if you didn't pay attention, you was going to fall by the wayside. And yeah. fortunately, you know, I'm still here to tell my story. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's so fascinating to hear to hear how different constituencies responded to it at the time. And then also, I think it's interesting, too. I mean, maybe part of what you're talking about, too, is the legacy that, um, you know, it sort of breaks my heart when I look at some of these numbers and see young black men, 20, you know, 18, 19, 20 yeah. years old, zero converting today and thinking that, you know, they they are immune from this whole thing. And I mean, at least today there is a, at least there's a treatment, not a cure, but a treatment. But as opposed to when you and I were young men, you know, it was a t total d death sentence at the time. Yeah. It breaks my heart at the time, or it breaks my heart to see these numbers where young black men and brown men uh, have such high net numbers of zero conversion. Yeah, it was, it's, and you know what, to me now, um, it's not spoken about as strongly as it was in the past, but yeah. it's still alive and well. Yeah, yeah. You know? Well, I know that you guys have put together a slideshow, and I think Paula has it, and she can share the uh, the screen. And also, just to let people know that uh, you can purchase uh, the the book that Sulio and Bo have made here. Uh, it's in the chat there for you to be able to purchase it directly from there. I think that's probably how we got it as well, too, or, or these guys sent it to us. But I'm going to hand it over to you and sort of have you sort of talk through these images and let our people see what's inside the, the book. Okay, this image right here, that's Tony. Tony was like a brother to me. I really don't accept um, people... <laughs> outside of my own DNA, outside of my own two brothers. I'm not one for embracing people saying that they're family members. But Tony, and there's another friend of mine in the book, Charles, I consider them like my brothers. So Tony here, um, he's in the adult bookstore, which we all worked in this adult bookstore called Fantasy World. 
So Tony initially worked there first. And then he got Tracy a job there. And he got myself a job. And Tony had the day shift. Tracy had the middle shift. And I had the graveyard shift. So we had the whole shift on lock. There was others who worked there, but we all knew each other like family. So what we used to do, we used to do all kind of crazy stuff in the store, especially on my shift by me having the great graveyard shift. Um, during the day, we used to have to count inventory. And the manager, you know, he would be breathing down our backs to make sure everything that came in got accounted for. So and if he where went, was the store? Was the store in Philly or in New York? Store, yeah, the store was in, in Philadelphia, Philadelphia. It was on the strip where you know, all the gays hung out, all the prostitutes. It was in a seedy part of town on 13th Street. Um, but that's where all the action was. That's where all the happening was. It was on 13th Street. So if... Um, it was two um, adult bookstores and a club that were owned by the same people. Um, it was, one was Fantasy World. I forget the name of the, the club. No, it was a bar. And the uh, corner store, I forget the name of it. But um, getting back to the inventory, we would throw stuff under the counter because we used to be on a high platform. So when, when the manager would be outside smoking or taking a break, we count the inventory and we would one, two, three, four, we would throw it under the counter. Throw it under the counter. So whoever came on the next shift, we would say, well, it's three of those, those on the counter, underneath the counter. And you know, we would sell it in pocket in pocket the money. And then we would do stuff like um like silly stuff. Guys would come in and you know, we were young. We, um there would be uh cruising us we'd be attracted to them you know get them to try on the candy underwear and in the booths or what have you model for us and um and then another time i was closing up and when you closed up you had to check all the booths to make sure everybody was out right so i could have swore i closed you know checked everything everything was proper counted the bank and then you would take it to the corner to the other store so I took the bank to the other store, and as I'm coming back past my store, I see this Asian man knocking on, <laughs> on the door where I had locked the man in the store. And I couldn't get him out because the, um, the manager, he didn't trust us. So, you know, he kept the key. So I had to call him and explain to him that I locked somebody in the store. <laughs> and, of course, it wasn't like you had a cell phone with you. You had to find a pay phone. And I'd, find, I'd put a dime in a pay phone to call him and get, get him to unlock the door. <laughs> exactly. And then I had a um a big boombox radio and we used to be blasting Blondie and Pat Benatar. It was it was crazy. We had a lot of fun. So we were probably like 21, 22, but we were having the time of our lives. Sure. <laughs> sure. So that's Tony. This is Trey. Trey um, was a singer and he was on the verge of becoming a serious comedian. Um, a lot of people thought Trey looked like a woman. He was not trans. He just was a feminine looking guy. He had a lot, a head full of his own hair, his own natural hair. And we were um, music freaks. So we, we would go out and um, shop for CDs and he was big on, um, oh God, when he would buy appliances, I forget this magazine he used to read, but he wouldn't make the purchase, not the consumer report. He would read the consumer report on whatever the appliance was and he would get the rating and that would depend on his, his purchase. But while we would be out, everybody thought we was a couple. So they wouldn't want to talk to him. They would always want to talk to me. They would say, oh, we want to talk to your husband. <laughs> we want to talk to your husband. <laughs> and then another time, like, um, we were in the car and we got stopped on a racial profiling tip. You know, so the cops, you know, they, they uh, flashed the light in the car and asked us our names. And then they asked Trey, you know, to produce the uh, license and registration. And when he opened up the glove compartment, 
like an avalanche of condoms fell out. <laughs> and the cop said, what do you need all those condoms for? And he said, I, I chew them when I get nervous. <laughs> <laughs> the cop fell out. And he just he just couldn't stop laughing. He, he let us go. So, you know, I, that's like, very funny. I, I mean, so but just talk to me a little bit about the piece that we're looking at of him. And so uh, this is some of your collage work. I mm -hmm. think. Yeah. So he, um, Trey was kind of chunky and he lost all this weight. And he bought himself a pair of leather pants. And um, the jacket he, he has on is one of my button jackets. And he was very supportive of my creativity. And he didn't, I didn't have to give it to him. He paid for it. Um, all the photos are from my actual photo album. So I tried to pick the best photos that, that complement each person that I was featuring. And then the um, collage pieces with the buttons, everything I do, I take close up photographs of it to sort of document what I'm doing and how I'm placing the buttons and my color combinations. So I have a whole folder of, of different images, close up, close up images of the button patterns. So I, you know, I was piecing patterns together to pull these photographs forward to make them, make them pop. So that's yeah. what I did. So you see one, in, I think that's the left, the bottom left, those are smaller buttons. And the thread is black. And then the top, you see they're larger buttons and they're close up to give it some uh, more dimension. So, you know, it was a lot of trial and error because this was my first attempt to make collages that went public that I was going to, you know, share with the public. And, you know, as I started um, getting more into them, they started getting better and better. So I started getting more comfortable with, with doing them. And in this particular collage, um, are some of the buttons that we're looking at in the white ones, are they in the jacket that Trey is wearing or are they from some other source? Actually, the, 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 the lower buttons, that's yep. from, a, from the very first sweater that I did. Got it. Okay. Um, and then this red, the red section, that piece is now in the um, FIT archives. So it's a section of the jacket. And the same thing with the other side, on the left side, I think that's red, I mean black, it's either black and gold or green and gold, that's the same jacket. So we have a few questions here, I'll break in with just one of these right now, and I'll break them up and, uh, and ask them as we go along. But, you know, before we go on to the next person, um, is there a particular lesson that you learned from some of these deceased friends? Is there a common thread that goes through them? The common thread is, is that um, we were truly like family. Mm -hmm. Like for me, friendship, whether it's intimate, romantic, or platonic, is about how a person makes you feel. These people made me feel my whole self, that I could be my true self with them. Um, when we met, and of course, when you're younger, you haven't been jaded. So you meet somebody one day and the next day they're your best friend. So a lot of these people, the first day that I met them, the friendship started there and it never stopped until they, they you know, um, until I lost them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Deep. No, I hear it. I hear it. And also I have to say that I love the way you describe those three classifications of relationships, whether they were intimate or whether they were romantic or whether they were friendship. And I think that's a really wonderful way of thinking about how, you know, how we put people in those different categories and are open to those relationships. Mm -hmm. And I have, a, I had a very positive relation, relationship with every last one of them. And that's not to say that, you know, we didn't have our little frictions and we didn't fuss and fight like mm -hmm. a real family, but for the most part of it, um, I love them with all my heart, and I still do. Yeah. Um, starting this project, the day before we actually started the project, uh, we'll get to uh, Tracy. This is Trey. We'll get to Tracy in a minute. Tracy died the day before. No. Um, 
it was just a roller coaster of emotions. It was a lot of highs and lows. You know, sometimes I had to push myself away from the table because I got so emotional. I had to stop. Right. Understandable. You know, I, you know, I was thinking about a lot of the good times, a lot of the bad times. It was just, it was a roller coaster. But it, all in all, I enjoyed every moment of producing this book for them. And That's great. Let's, let's move on to the next one. Now, this is Renee. Moi, Renee. Renee was a... Um, Jamaican from Jamaica lived in the neighborhood mostly everybody lived in the neighborhood except for maybe three or four but we all came from the same neighborhood I met um Renee through Antoine which is another friend um Renee was the first of our group to move to New York and actually we were supposed to come together we was going to come straight from high school and just come to New York but he wanted to come to New York blindly. I, I was like, well, where are we going to live at? How are we going to get a job? We didn't know anybody. So I didn't take an offer and he left. And um, when I came back to visit him, he was living on the Upper West Side with, um, with an older white guy. Um, the story he told me that he was on the board on some kind of board at the Metropolitan, right? But it was almost like he was living in the um, in this arranged relationship. Like he was waiting for this man to die so he could collect all this money. I'm like, I'm not doing that. You know, if I'm going to be in a relationship, it's going to be a real genuine relationship coming from myself and whoever I'm dealing with. So. I was against the relationship, but he was still a friend of mine, and that's how he wanted to live his life. I made a comment, and that was it. We kept it moving. But he was very, um, he was a Leo, so he was very theatrical. Three, three, <laughs> theatrical. Um, he had a big personality, big heart. Um, he was the host of this club called Midtown 43, and he hosted all kind of inter entertainment in the club, and then also... He had his own club underground hit called Miss Honey, and they still play Miss Honey in the clubs today. Mm. And that was his catchphrase is, um, he would either say, if I introduced you to him, he would say, hi, Miss Honey, or he would say, hi, Love Juice. Those, those were his two catchphrases. But he was very, very entertaining. Um, we used to go to this club called The Garage. The Garage was classic they will never ever have a club like that again but when we would go to the garage it would be like maybe two thousand people in the, in the garage i well, see him lonesome just command everybody's attention in the club just dancing and doing uh, making chants and it would just be all eyes on him he was one of them kind of people he was destined for starting or destined for some type of greatness. And so what happened to him? He got murdered. Ooh. He got murdered in the park. This wow. is what I heard. He got murdered in the park. Mm -hmm. um, in this uh, caption here, he was featured in the Village Voice magazine, and they talked about the... Um, the Caribbean response to the LGBT community, the violence and the, all the negativity that was coming from their community. And they interviewed him and several others from the community who were from the islands. I can't go into depth of what verbatim what, what his response was, but I think it was a great article from what I can remember. That's great. And so it does raise the question because I, I was sort of thinking about it as you were describing the period that he was first to go to New York and then you followed. And so I was thinking about, you know, what was it that you thought New York would, would do for you? What, what, what was it that you thought was going to be there? And then the question um, that was posed here is that, you know, what do you think about what your friends valued most um, and they're living the lives that they did at the time. 
And so it's kind of a two-part question I have for you. What was the anticipation? And then what, what, what was the value that p- people found in those lives at that time? Um, the anticipation as far as coming to New York, Philadelphia is very small. Um, and Philadelphia is a very conservative town. So as far as opportunities, the opportunities were very slim. So we were thinking that if we moved to New York, it was a larger pool of um, activities, um, Broadway, the, the, what, the theater, dance, you could, could become an actor, you could become a singer. It was just more opportunities for you to do things creatively, right? But you just have to, you had to get in where you fit in, so to speak. Um, and then you had to be around like-minded people to stay focused because there was a lot of other things here to distract you, such as sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Sure. You know? So if you, um, Trey used to say, um, people who were sexually addicted, we used to call it the sexual nation tour, right? So the sexual nation tour meant, you you know, you could have multiple par- partners a night, multiple partners during the week, the month. It was just, you know, you were high strung sexually. So it was like a drug. Yeah. You know, and then you, you had drugs. It was, um, I came here during the height of crack. And it was easily to really get involved with that. Uh, one of the first buildings that, I lived in, it was a crack infested building, but everybody got along. Um, There was no uh, disrupts, nobody disrupted anybody's life or lifestyle. It was just like one happy family, but they were just drug addicts. Yeah. The next door to me, um, he used to shoot heroin, you know? Um, And at that point in my life, I had not lived like that before. So I had to humble myself in the way that I was living to um, sort of sustain living here, to stay. You know, I had no friends. I hadn't had anything. And, and um, I lived with Renee first. And this is after he broke up with his partner or whatever kind of relationship that was. He lived in this little teeny room. So I'm thinking he's here. He might have been here five or six years before me. And initially I was supposed to stay in Jersey and it didn't work out. So I called him, I told him I was stranded and, you know, could I come and stay with him until I got myself together? So um, when I got to his place, when he opened the door, the door, the room was so small, you could, you had to crack the door and slide your body in the door. And the type of person he was, I was really disappointed because I thought he was going to be further along being the type of um, the personality he had, the the, the quality and the characteristics of what he presented. I saw him bigger than that. Yeah. But at the same time, I don't want to get into his his addiction, but he he had addiction issues. And that was a part of why he didn't get further and what he was doing. Sure. You know. And ultimately, ultimately may have led to his demise. We don't know. Of course, you say he was murdered. Well, let's let's move on to the next one. Oh. This is me and my, I'm looking really sassy and sexy. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> and that's that's Tracy that I was telling you about early, who passed the day before the project got off the ground. So this is us hanging out one night on the strip. You know, somebody came by with a camera. And of course, we were always ready to pose in front of somebody's camera. Um, this particular night, um, I think I melt, I melted the lens right here. You know, my, my makeup was on to perfection. Um, I was really thin. Uh, I think I had my sister's pocketbook this little tight t-shirt, mini skirt, the little jacket that I'm wearing. I had my embroidered my name on it back and did a whole bunch of crazy crafty things on it that I still have. And um, this 
these buttons here are from a pillow that I made for my mother. My mother requested that I make her a black pillow with black on black buttons with black thread. So I sort of pieced this in the sea of black buttons to make us pop. And I, I think we, you know, I could have did the picture alone, but you know, Tracy, that, that was my girl. So I, I shared the, the shot with her. But you know, Bo, you talked about this before about the importance of archives. And, and I mean, looking at this and looking at, you know, this being part of your history of one individual's history here and looking at the buttons uh, for the pillow that you made here, it's so important for these things to be kept and to be preserved because it is really, they are representations of the culture that you lived in a very exciting time, which was really, you know, American culture and black culture at that particular point. And uh, I'm so happy you're thinking about pre preserving these things because it's just terrific to see them. And then actually, I don't know if we have a picture with the three of us, but we had, we did. Yes, okay, the next one. Um, this was my closest, closest friend. Out of all of them, we did everything together. Now, this is us here. We called ourselves the Strange Beauties. We actually had a punk, a punk rock band. Um, we were the vocalists. Um, my family, I had two cousins that are musicians. Uh, we saw Deb well, I saw Deborah Harry on TV one day, and I was really fascinated by her. And Tracy was at my house this particular day. And I was like, you got to see this white girl. She is just gorgeous. I love the song that she was singing. And she, uh, Tracy came in the room and we just fell in love with her. So the next day we went out and bought all Blondie's re records, all the albums. We learned all the songs. And um, at that time, Tracy was uh, um, doing shows. It was a female impersonator. And she started impersonating um, Debbie. And she used to do Donna Ross and Donna Summers. And I came up with this idea that I, I really thought it was simple. We started going to the punk clubs. And it was a, this club called the Hot Club in Philadelphia. And I saw a poster of um, the Plasmatics, which <clears throat> their front lady was Wendy O. Williams. And on the poster, she had a, a fishnets on her underwear had pasties on her nipples. I said, we have to go see this show tonight. So we went to the show tonight and that was the first time I went to a punk concert. So we came in, the floor was clear, but by the time we left, we were dancing in maybe two inches of glass. Wow. On stage, um, again, Wendy had the same outfit on, no top. She had tape across her nipples. Uh, one of the guys was dressed like a nun. They had a coffin on the stage. They had ax hammers and this it was just totally disturbed. But we loved it. We loved it. And we were all in drag and nobody said anything. It was, you know, we were one of the girls for the night. So we kept going. And then we went to another uh this the Elks Club where um where Bessie Smith had a funeral in Philly. At the time, I didn't know it, but they used to throw punk concerts there. And, you know, we used to slam dance with the punk guys and, you know, beat them with our pocketbooks. And <laughs> we had a ball. And then we would, you know, we would use the ladies' room and the, the girls, they, got, they, didn't, they didn't pass no mind. It was just like, it was a part of the family. So we kept going because they didn't discriminate. Yeah, so, no, um, it's... It's absolutely true. And it's interesting thinking about how much the genre doesn't exist anymore. And I sort of wonder, you know, what, uh, what people have uh, to go to, what young people have to experience the same thing. You know, Sulia, I wanna, we only have a few minutes left here and I wanna sort of turn to you. So as somebody who tried to spearhead this absolutely fascinating project about what was, um, what life was like, um, at this time through the eyes of, through Bo's eyes. Um, what do you want people to get, uh, to take away for, from this? Um, you know, as he said, just to the importance of preserving and documenting your life and your archive, I think that's so significant. You know, a lot of 
his friends who passed, um, you know, they didn't get the opportunity to document their lives and to have it carried forth. Um, and so he is telling that story also to, you know, broaden our understanding of the Black LGBTQ plus experience. I think that's so important. And to find joy and inspiration in this book, you know, when I was editing it and working very closely with Bo on it, you know, there were times I could see how emotional he was. So I had to, you know, put down the manager hat, put on the partner hat. And so it just made me reflect on the importance of the friendships in my life and, you know, the love of, for my family and, and, and those people and just valuing that, I think is such a significant thing. Yeah, no, I think that's beautifully said. It's an important part. Um, as I said, we only have a minute or two. We actually, we, we are out of time, but Bo, I have to say, we have one request here. And you may have to you may have to do this uh, a cappella, but we have a request here to give us a demonstration of your vocals, the song that you and your friends sang when you had a rock group. You want to sing us out here? Uh, hey, Evelyn, we used to do a song <laughs> called "Fact to Fact," right? And "Fact to Fact" was like a print song, so it goes "Fact to Fact," front to back. This is no fiction. This is no game. I'm a real live legend that still remains. Calling out your lover's name, calling out your lover's name, while my pleasures entertain, while my presence still remain. I saw you walking one on one. I saw you naked, having fun. You mentioned my collage. This is sheer mirage, back to back, front to back. This is no fiction. This is no game. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Oh, my God. Uh, you know, I have to say, Bo, in all of these shows that we've done, you're the first person who's sung on one of these shows. So it's absolutely wonderful. And so, again, folks, um, here's the book. Uh, please go to uh, Bo's uh, website to get a copy of it. It's absolutely beautiful. You get to see all these beautiful collages and read stories about uh, and le learn about these 10 amazing individuals who have passed. Um, I want to say thank you to my colleague, Paula Sierra, who's back here. And so, uh, hi, Paula. We see, there you are. Nice to see you. Thank you. And uh, thank you. And uh, for those of, of you who are going to be in Miami this weekend, stop by and see us at the Miami Book Fair. We'll be there Friday, Saturday, and Sunday this weekend. Um, Sulio and Bo, thank you. You guys were just fabulous tonight. It was really just amazing. I've learned a tremendous amount. And thank you for really sort of working so hard to keep this culture alive. Uh, keep on spreading the word and making it happen. We'll do the best that we can um, and find a good archive. Call me if you want um, any kind of help and trying to help you try to place these things. Um, I'll, be, I'll, I'll help in any way that I can because it's an important part of American culture and of LGBTQ culture, and, and it can't be destroyed. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank okay. You. Great to see you all. Good night, everybody. We will see you next week. So long. <laughs>